Hola. ¿Se oye? ¿Funciona? No. ¿Ahora sí? Ah, porque ellos parece que no. Es por el ruido. Hola, hola. Bueno, bienvenidos a las, a las conferencias que hacemos dentro del Máster en Diseño Gráfico aquí en Ilsaba. Esta, de hecho, es la, la primera dentro del posgrado en Diseño Editorial. Eh, bueno, como habéis visto, a partir de ahora las vamos a hacer en, en jueves para no coincidir nunca más con el fútbol y que todos podáis venir sin problema. Entonces, bueno, hoy yo creo que no requiere mucha introducción, pero... Es Mark Porter, yo creo que es su, su momento, digamos, de, 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 de gloria, por decirlo así, fue el momento del, del rediseño del Guardian y, y sobre todo yo creo que la, la aplicación de, de iPad del Guardian que generó como todo un nuevo, un nuevo sistema, una nueva lógica que muchos más siguieron. Pero bueno, hoy nos va a explicar un poco su trayectoria porque tiene mucho interesante que hizo antes de ese momento y luego, evidentemente, después de ese gran trabajo también ha realizado otros muy interesantes. Así que nada, ya le damos paso y gracias a todos por asistir. Thank you, Mark. Okay, it's working now. Thank you. Yes? Hello. Or, uh, hola, if you prefer. I do speak a little bit of Spanish, but I'm afraid I'm going to talk English today. I'm sure your English is better than my Spanish and certainly better than my Catalan. So I'll try to speak slowly and hopefully you will understand. I am Mark Porter, that's my Twitter name. If anybody wants to tweet or follow me, that would be very nice. And the title of this talk is 25 years in editorial design, which makes me sound like a very old man. Um, and I'm supposed to be talking for 90 minutes. Now I do have a lot to talk about, but 90 minutes is a very long time to listen to anybody talking. So if you start to get bored, just shout or wave your hands or something, and I will try to finish quickly. So I suppose I describe myself as an editorial designer. And when I started out in this business, and for more than half of my career, being an editorial designer meant really that you did stuff like this. You probably designed magazines, maybe you designed some books, or maybe a newspaper. But in the course of my career, everything kind of changed. And nowadays, being an editorial designer means you probably still design magazines and maybe newspapers and books, but you also design websites, you design apps for lots of different devices, and maybe television, and identities. So the, the scope of the job has changed enormously. And I'm going to talk to you about my projects and the work that I've done over the course of my design career. But I'm also just going to talk a bit about the changes in the industry, how they've affected me, and how designers have had to adapt to the changes in media. So I had quite an unusual training to be a graphic designer. I studied modern languages at Trinity College, Oxford. <laughs> um, I'd always done design at, as a hobby at school and stuff, but I, I never had the opportunity to go to design college, unlike you, so you're very lucky. I had to go to Oxford instead. And you might think that going to a university like this was a kind of completely useless training to be a designer. In fact, that's not strictly true. I learned a lot of things at Oxford that actually I still use every day in the work that I do. And I think that sometimes we fetishize creativity and we think that being creative is just about 
having incredible ideas that kind of come out of nowhere. But in fact, if you're being a designer as a business and you're doing it for a living, a lot of what you do is not about having brilliant ideas. It's about analyzing problems, thinking structurally, communicating with people, uh, selling your work, making coherent explanations for things. And those are all things that actually I learned quite a lot about studying at Oxford. Certainly that kind of analytical thinking is very useful to me when I work with clients and I have to analyze their problems in order to find design solutions to them. So it wasn't such a bad thing going to a university like this. But probably the, the most important lesson that I learned at Oxford was what I learned from working with just the absolutely brilliant minds that were there. When I was studying there, really all I had to do was every week I would write one essay, take it to my tutor and read it to him, and then have a discussion for about an hour about the subject and about what I'd written. And bearing in mind that these people were some of the, the most incredible minds on the planet in the subjects that we were talking about, there was really nowhere to hide. You really had to think hard, be at the top of your game, uh, and they didn't give you any place for sort of loose thinking. Uh, and that was the best lesson that I learned. Always work with people smarter than you. And that's something that I've tried to do all the way through my career. Uh, I'm always happy to hire young designers into the studio who are smarter than me, because I think I can learn from them. And it's something that, you know, as you go through your careers, please bear this in mind. Never be afraid to be around people who are smarter than you because you learn from them. And learning is the essence of what we do. So I started out kind of not sure what I wanted to do when I left university. I'd always loved design, but I became a designer more or less by accident. I got a job in the marketing department of this little tiny magazine for wine enthusiasts. And uh, they didn't have a proper design department because it was a very small magazine. So I decided I was going to redesign the magazine, which, looking back on it, was incredible because I knew absolutely nothing. And the work that I did was pretty rubbish, really, but they accepted it, so I kind of became a designer. Uh, this was the first issue of the redesign that I did. This is the first photograph I ever commissioned as an art director, a picture of a wine bottle. But the work that I did on that magazine enabled me to get jobs in other places and continue to work with really smart people. And I learned an incredible amount in the first few years of my career by just working with editors and art directors. And kind of that was my design education, really. I never had a design education at college, so I had to have my design education in a form of apprenticeship from working with some brilliant people. So I worked on all sorts of magazines, consumer magazines, business magazines, monthlies, weeklies, bi-monthlies, and eventually I got a job on this magazine, and this was my first real art director gig. It was the magazine of the Evening Standard newspaper in London, and it was a glossy, glossy magazine that came out once a month. The editor had worked at Condé Nast, and it had that kind of Condé Nast attitude, very kind of glamorous uh, mainstream magazine. And that was the first place where I really got a chance to kind of do my own thing and be an art director. We had some great fun there, did some nice uh, stories. And then they decided that they wanted to change the magazine and publish it weekly instead and refocus it slightly as more of a kind of uh, a city magazine, more like New York magazine or something. And they were going to change the format, make it a big sort of tabloid format. So we ended up producing this magazine. And we had this idea, which was quite sort of brave at the time, that instead of the celebrity covers or the models on the cover, we would go for a more New Yorkerish approach to the cover. You can see this is very influenced by the New Yorker. We would have illustrations about London, or we would just send photographers out to take quirky, kind of surprising photographs of things around London. And there would be no typography on the cover, apart from this little line at the bottom explaining what the content was about. So everyone was very enthusiastic about this. Great idea. The editor loved it. Um, we did it. It worked beautifully for about five or six weeks. And then eventually everyone decided, no, no, we've got to have some big cover lines on the cover. And then later on, they started bringing back the models and celebrities on the cover. And that taught me another really valuable lesson, which is that nothing good lasts forever. And I've been lucky enough to work in some amazing places over the years. 
work with some brilliant people, and there are always moments where you get to do something really good. Sometimes it's just a matter of weeks, as it was there. Sometimes it's a matter of months, or actually The Guardian, it lasted years, uh, but it never lasts forever. You know, people change, circumstances change, new editors come in, the budgets disappear. Uh, so you have to make the most of those moments when everything comes together and you can do something good. So after that, I went freelance for a bit. Uh, I did various projects, including this, which most of you probably weren't even alive when this came out. Uh, it's about 20 years old. Um, have we, the newspaper, wanted a redesign. They came to some friends of mine in London to pitch for it. In fact, Roger Black from New York ended up designing the paper. But my friend's studio ended up designing the magazine, and I worked with them on it. So this was the, the Sunday magazine of Avui. This was the first issue uh, in, uh, with Stoikopf, who was a big player at Barca at the time. And I was lucky enough to be here when Barca won La Liga and kind of went down to the Ramblas to join in the celebrations. That was a great moment. But while I was working on this, I got a call about another magazine in Italy called Colors which is still going, I think. It's published by Benetton, the, uh, the fashion company. And it was a strange magazine because it didn't kind of have a commercial purpose as a publishing operation. It was more just a kind of promotion for the Benetton spirit and the Benetton ethos. Uh, and it was edited by this remarkable man, Tibor Kalman, who you may have heard of, who was uh, a sort of larger than life character, very sadly died in 1999. He had a design studio in New York called M & Co for a long time. Very high profile, kind of provocative character. Uh, there's a kind of mythology that surrounds Tibor, which is mainly true. He was a, a sort of strange, brilliant, eccentric character. Very difficult to work with. Probably the most difficult person I've ever worked with. The most demanding person I've ever worked with. But really brilliant too. And I learned some amazing things from working with Tibor on that magazine. And Tibor used to enjoy provoking people, and he often used to say things like this. Why do designers think they have better ideas about what things should look like than ordinary human beings? Now, um, when Tibor said things like this, you didn't always take them at face value, because, of course, Tibor believed in design just as much as anybody. And uh, I believe in design. I think a good designer is an expert, and in general, I believe experts have an important role to play in society. If I go into hospital to have an operation, I want to be operated on by an expert surgeon, and I want an expert accountant doing my taxes. So experts are good, but I think what Tibor was getting at here was that there can be a kind of elitist attitude in design, and there are a lot of designers around who actually design for other designers, or for themselves. They don't design for the audience. And Tibor used to say things like this to remind us that we're not designing for ourselves, we're not designing for the design community, we're designing for customers at the end of the day who read these magazines and newspapers and we should never forget who they are and we should never design in a way that's patronizing to them. Uh, and I really took this to heart. This is probably the most important lesson that I learned in the whole period that I worked there. So Colors was a magazine, and still is a magazine, about global culture, about what goes on everywhere in the world, the way people live. And uh, you have to understand, we were doing this magazine 20 years ago when the internet didn't really exist. It was before Flickr, it was before YouTube, it was before Instagram. And in those days, it was actually quite hard to see photographs of what was going on in other places. The only way we could get the pictures to show people what was going on in the world was by having a series of picture editors in Paris and Rome and New York. And every issue, they would get in 10,000, 15,000 photographs, which in those days were physical slides and transparencies before the days of digital images. Uh, and we would just go through all these images looking for amazing pictures to tell the stories. So the heart of every issue was a photo essay like this on the, the theme which in this case was shopping. It was an issue devoted to shopping. Uh, and we would just find the most incredible pictures from all over the world and try and put them together in a way that kind of had surprising juxtapositions and told the story in a way that made people want to engage with it. And working with pictures in this way, 
was just a fascinating process from which I learned an incredible amount. I used to do these photo essays first and then Tibor would inevitably take them away and do them completely differently and do them himself and do them much better than I ever could. But working with him I learned a lot about working with photography and one of the things that he used to say was let the pictures speak to you. He had this theory that if you spread all the pictures out on the table and just focus and look at the pictures and get rid of all other distractions, eventually the pictures would start talking to you and sort of telling you how they wanted to be used. It sounds completely insane, but it's actually true. And you know, it's harder to do now than it was in those days, because in those days we didn't all have mobile phones, we didn't all have email landing on our desk every moment. But it's still incredibly important that if you work with photography, you have to clear your mind, just focus on the pictures, and let the pictures speak to you. So this, this shopping issue, which is my first issue of Colours, was really just a catalogue of all sorts of weird stuff that you could buy around the world. Uh, and we would play games with the images, working with the juxtapositions, in some cases purely visual, like this, where you have a gun and a submarine that kind of looks like a gun. Or in other cases, you'd try and find a kind of conceptual connection. On the left here is a packet of heroin that one of our correspondents went out and bought on the streets of New York. And on the right are some kind of sticking plasters that Japanese women wear to protect their boobs. So there's an obvious connection with the Playboy bunny there. This was a virtual reality headset which was modeled by Charles, the head of our research department at Colors. And it just looked so much like he was having some kind of digital drug experience that we had to put in next to a real drug capsule of Prozac. And these were two different coffins. In Africa, coffins are a really big thing. They hand carve coffins in incredible shapes with wonderful kind of ideas. And on the right was a guinea pig coffin from, I think, America, uh, where there are a lot of spoiled pets. So we had this guinea pig coffin which we were trying to photograph and of course you can't photograph a guinea pig coffin without a guinea pig. So we went to the pet shop to buy a guinea pig but of course when you put a coffin, a guinea pig in a coffin, it doesn't want to stay in the coffin, it wants to get up and walk away. So then we thought, well, how are we going to make the guinea pig keep still? Should we kill the guinea pig? But nobody wanted to kill the guinea pig. So in the end we went to the pharmacy and got some ether and etherize the guinea pig, which would knock it out for about 10 seconds. <laughs> so it would lie there while we shoot off a few exposures. Then the guinea pig would wake up, you'd have to put the ether back on it, and it would knock out for another 10 seconds, take a few more photos. And you know, I tell this story just to show the kind of lengths we used to go to, to get pictures that could tell the story. And um, there's a great quote from Stefan Sagmeister. Great work is formerly good work, which has been pushed very hard, and I really do believe this. In most cases, if you see a great piece of work, it's not because they had a better idea than somebody else, or a bigger idea, or more brilliance. It's because they had a good idea, and they worked and worked and worked at it to craft it and hone it and improve it. And that was very much the attitude at Colours. Now, one of the most interesting things about Colours was that it was done the other way around from almost every magazine in the world. In most magazines, the editors will commission a story from a writer and then the art director reads the story and thinks of a way to visualize the story. But in colors, we would start with the visuals. And Tibor used to do these little sketches, very, very crude sketches, just kind of generating a, a visual idea for a story. And all these sketches would be stuck up on his wall. He had an amazing office which was entirely lined with cork board that you could stick push pins in. And uh, these sketches would all go up on the wall. If you look up in the top left hand corner there, you can just about see a sketch for a story for an issue devoted to sports, which was about different kind of balls. So we'd have the sketch, and then I would go away, take Tibor's rough sketches and do a much more detailed sketch of the story. And then we'd go and shoot all the props to match the layout and put the layout together. And then at the very end, the writers would come in and fill in the captions. So it was exactly the other way around to how most magazines work and great revenge for our directors and designers to be the people who determine what the writers should do because it's nearly always the other way around. The writers write first and the art directors have to respond. 
So we did this issue about sport. That was my second issue, which had some fantastic stories in it. Uh, this was one where we really wanted to kind of uh, express the intensity of doing sport at a high level. So we just cropped in on tiny little parts of pictures of people doing sport to show the kind of energy and commitment there. I did an issue about travel. And um, there's a guy called Richard Turley, who used to work with me at The Guardian in London, who went to New York to be the art director of Bloomberg Business Week. Richard says this is the best magazine cover of all time. It's uh, a picture from a Aloha Airlines flight in Hawaii of a Boeing 737, which was coming into land when the roof blew off. And nobody got killed, luckily. They managed to land it. But this is literally a real plane on the runway, having just landed with no roof. And then my last issue was devoted to heaven, ideas of paradise and different cultures, exploring things like, you know, heaven is water. If you don't have water, if you don't have access to clean water, then water could be what heaven is, or maybe a bicycle is what heaven is. And the center spread of this issue was this gatefold about sex in heaven, which was just a typical colors production. We shot this in New York. It was a massive undertaking. There were kind of 15 or so different models. You had to find the models, cast the models. You had to find models who would do full frontal nudity, which is quite difficult. Most models won't take their clothes off. You need a special kind of model for that. They all needed stylists, hair, makeup, you know, incredibly complicated, expensive, and slow thing to pull together. And then we comped all the photographs together with a bunch of quotes. And you know, I used to worry sometimes about the amount of money we were spending or how much time we were putting into these things. And Tibor told me something that I've always remembered, which was nobody remembers if you miss the deadline. Nobody remembers if you bust the budget. But if you do work that sucks, they'll remember forever. Um, it's quite irresponsible of me to say this to you because actually I usually try to be very disciplined about budgets and I try to be very disciplined about deadlines. But really in the end, it's the quality of the work that matters. Uh, and this is a nice way of expressing that, I think. So Colors was great, but it was very intense. I was working with a bunch of crazy Americans seven days a week for a year. By the end of it, as you can see, I was going a little bit mad. So I had to get out and get back to London. And when I arrived in London, the first thing that I did was I was the launch art director on the UK edition of Wired magazine. It was the first edition that they'd launched outside of America. And that was interesting because it was the first time that I'd really started to work with technology. You know, we were using Macs at Colors, but for example, the retouching would be sent off to New York to some, you know, retouching house that had massive computers. This was the first place that I started really doing Photoshop work in-house for publication. But the most interesting thing about working at Wired was also it was my first introduction to technology. The, the crew from California who'd set the magazine up came to London and they would sit at their desks every morning and read their email. Uh, this, like, I had never seen email before. I had no idea what these people were doing sitting in front of their computers for an hour every morning. But of course, this was all happening when the internet was just starting to take off. Uh, you know, this was the kind of web browser that was around in those days. And, you know, newspapers and media people were just starting to get to grips with the internet. This was the first New York Times website in 1996. And The Guardian actually started a website around about then as well, which was, you know, not particularly brilliantly designed. But, you know, I, I had to sort of know that the internet was happening because I was working on Wired magazine, but I didn't really engage with it personally. But it was just the beginning of something and a feeling that something new was going on. But after that, I went to The Guardian to redesign the weekend magazine. And I was supposed to be there for two weeks after the redesign, explaining to the team how it worked. And I ended up leaving over 15 years later because it was just such a great place to work. So I became our director of this magazine. And it couldn't have been more different to Colors, really. Colors had the resources of the Benetton Corporation behind it. Uh, money was no object, really. On weekends, I was the art department. I did all the layouts myself. At that time, I didn't even have a photo editor. There was just a picture researcher. 
I did all the commissioning myself. Eventually, I was able to build up a bit of a team. Uh, we got some designers, we got some photo editors, and it became a proper magazine. But for a while, it was just a crazy doing everything myself thing. But it was a really nice, refreshing contrast to colours. Uh, this was a cover that we did then, which got a lot of attention at the time. There used to be this band called the Spice Girls in England. You're probably much too young to know about them. But they were a kind of girl band, manufactured band, uh, very much controlling their public image. And um, we used to try on this magazine, when we took pictures of celebrities, to do it without stylists and without makeup, to try and get behind the kind of facade and really humanize people. But the Spice Girls, it was impossible to get them without styling and makeup. So uh, we decided to do something different, and uh, the picture editor, Vivian Hamley, and I commissioned a brilliant photographer called Nigel Shaffron to go to New York and shoot the Spice Girls. And he ended up taking pictures of their hands and their feet. And of course, they, their look was so distinctive that they're completely recognizable just from their shoes. So by looking at the shoes, everybody knew who it was. But even having an idea about doing a cover like this, in most cases, it would never actually get published. But we also had a brilliant, unconventional editor then called Deborah Orr, who loved this cover and made it happen. Uh, so it's another lesson that no matter how great you think your ideas are, if you don't have the support of your editor, they're probably never going to get published. So I became art director of Weekend, and I stayed at The Guardian for a long time, and I did a lot of other things while I was there, but I still stuck close to Weekend. And in fact, over the course of the next 15 years, I redesigned this magazine six times. It's since been redesigned again a couple of years ago, or last year, without me. The first time it was redesigned without me. But it's, uh, I don't know if anyone else has ever redesigned the same magazine six times. It was pretty historic. But really, at The Guardian, the, the most fantastic thing was the content. I got to work with some wonderful stories. Content is a horrible word. It's a really ugly word, and I, I prefer not to use it, but it kind of, everybody knows what it means, so you end up using it. But the content of The Guardian was really high-quality journalism, and it was a privilege to be finding a visual form for this content. When you start off in the magazine business, you think it's cool to kind of do fashion because you get to meet models or to do celebrity interviews because you get to go on photo shoots and hang out with famous people. And then there comes a moment, which is usually sometime in your mid-30s or when you have children, when you start to think, actually, you know, hanging out with models and celebrities is not really what I want to be doing. I want to be doing some real stories. And at The Guardian, I got to work with some absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, this was an incredible issue. Just when the AIDS epidemic in Africa was exploding, there was a, a wonderful photographer called Gideon Mendel who spent years there documenting the spread of AIDS. Uh, and we worked very closely with him publishing his stuff. And the opportunity to work with that kind of material was absolutely amazing, really. We did a series of special magazines about food, about how the industry and corporations were taking over food and what was going into the food that we were eating. And I remember Richard Turley saying this was a, a pivotal moment for him when we actually took a piece of raw meat and stuck it on the scanner to make the magazine cover. Um, but great content, again, getting to work with fantastic stories and material. And probably the culmination of that was this, which was a, a big, full broadsheet newsprint supplement about this woman in Malawi called Grace, who was HIV positive, but couldn't afford the drugs that she needed in order to avoid developing full-blown AIDS. Uh, and our reporters had discovered that the reason for that was because of patents and copyright protection by the drug companies. So we chased this route back from Grace, through her doctor, to the vice president of Malawi, through the UN, eventually ending up with this guy who was the chief executive of the drug company, who was maintaining the prices at a high level and felt that it was his responsibility as a businessman to stop people selling cheap drugs in Africa. And um, on a story like this, I was able to use the kind of techniques that I'd learned at Colors about how to work with photography and so on to tell a story that was just really important, that actually meant something in the real world. And in the end, there was a happy ending. Grace got her drugs. She's still alive. 
and the law was changed and cheap generic AIDS drugs did become available in Africa. But the wonderful thing about doing this was that these stories engaged you on every level. You know, normally when you're a designer, you're using your head and you're being professional, but you don't use your heart that much. But when you work on stories like this, you actually get emotionally involved with them. And there were moments when I was working on these stories where I was sitting at the Mac with tears in my eyes, trying to do layouts, and it was just an incredible privilege to do work like that. But while I was doing that, in another building around the corner, people were working on a website. And Neville Brody did this design. And The Guardian was the first newspaper, certainly in the UK, to decide that this thing, the internet, was important and that they should put some of their best people on it. So they put some very talented young journalists on the website. And it started to kind of grow and get some attention. But again, I was the, the creative director of the newspaper. And I really had nothing to do with this. It was all happening somewhere else in another building. And I didn't really know much about it. So I was continuing to do my specials and um, work on the newspaper. And then this happened in September 2001. And this was a, you know, a moment for those of us who worked in newspapers. It was obviously an earth-shattering event that we had to respond to. And uh, a moment where you feel you need to use all your journalistic skills to tell a story. But it also happened at a really interesting moment because it happened kind of at the end of a period when newspapers had incredible authority and influence. And after this moment, it seemed to fade away. But we, we put a paper together on this day and you know I can't really take the credit for what this paper looks like because on a day like this, the editor has a big influence on the layouts. All the journalists have a big influence. I played my part and we put together a, you know, a remarkable newspaper really using the color printing which had only been possible for a few years, the amazing photography of this event to try and tell the story. But it, it's interesting because we, a few years later we looked at the sales of all the quality newspapers in the UK and as you can see by 2003 they're all going down but there was this kind of bump here in September 2001, and it just seemed like that was the last moment when people went back to newspapers trying to help themselves make sense of the world. You know, they thought newspapers might help them understand these incredible events, but it seemed to be just a kind of blip, and then after that, newspaper readership started to decline. So this was a problem for all, everyone who was in the newspaper business, particularly quality newspapers. So the Independent and the Times, who were our two big competitors, decided that they were going to respond to this decline in sales by producing a tabloid edition, which, you know, it, it's hard to understand how momentous that was, probably if you live in Spain, where all the serious newspapers have always been tabloids. But in most of Europe and America, the serious newspapers were always really big, broadsheet newspapers, and the tabloids, the small newspapers, were always down market, popular newspapers. So this was a real a kind of shocking moment, really. And uh, The Guardian thought we would have to play along. We produced a couple of tabloid dummies. One of them was very radical, and we did some research on that, and everybody hated it, so we decided not to do that. One of them was just a kind of reimagining of the existing design in a tabloid format. Uh, but in the end, we decided not to do that, because Alan Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian, felt that if we adopted the format of the tabloids, we would end up by adopting the kind of editorial approach of the tabloids. So he wanted to do something different and decided that The Guardian should be a Berliner, which is a sort of intermediate format, which is popular in France and Switzerland. Some great newspapers like Le Monde in France and the Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Switzerland are Berliners. But the problem was that the, there wasn't a factory in Britain that could print a Berliner at that time. So The Guardian had to build their own factory in order to print this newspaper, which cost, I think, something like 80 million pounds in sterling, which is about 120 million euro, I think. And it took 18 months, nearly two years to build, which gave us time to design a new newspaper. So we were looking around at the newspapers that were out there, and you know, we love these newspapers, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, the New York Times, the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, they seem to represent what a serious, authoritative newspaper should be. 
but they were also very old-fashioned and rather boring. And there had been a revolution in printing, which had meant that there was a whole new wave of newspapers coming out, which were full colour, very dynamic, lively and modern looking. But most of those were pretty lightweight journalistically and were being given away for free or were very cheap. So we set about trying to make a newspaper that had all the good stuff about the old-fashioned newspapers mixed up with the good stuff from the new newspapers. And this is what we did. That was a TV advert that ran about twice at about two o'clock in the morning on British TV because that was the only times we could afford to run it. Um, but as you can see, it was a complete reimagining of the newspaper in every possible way. It was stripped right down to the basics and completely rebuilt from the ground up and an amazing project to work on. Um, that slide is in the wrong place, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the first thing that I tend to do with any project, uh, particularly newspaper projects, is start with the grid. And, um, you know, when I said earlier that I think a lot of good design is not about having brilliant ideas, particularly publication design, it's amazing how much of it is about mathematics and engineering. And every time we start to design a new printed product, whether it's a magazine or a newspaper, we start by working out the page size and the print area, and then I get somebody in the studio to get their calculator out and work out how many lines of readable text we can fit on a page. Uh, and then we try and create these modular grids made up of a series of blocks which give us a kind of fundamental architecture to hang all the elements on. And, you know, the reason for doing that is partly just that I'm kind of obsessive about it and I like everything to line up and I like there to be a kind of architectural system but particularly on a newspaper, it's very important that you have that because on any given day, there's probably 20 or 30 different people designing pages for The Guardian. Some of them will be trained designers, but a lot of them will be journalists. Some of them are journalists who do understand design. Some of them are people who frankly don't understand design. So to get a degree of consistency across that, you have to have a kind of system. So making sure that every element occupies a kind of regular space means that all the way through the paper, the levels are the same, the spacing is the same. Even down to the headlines, you know, we work out when we design a newspaper, we decide the size of the headlines based on how many lines of the grid they occupy. So in this case, this was the headline for a sort of average length of um, news story. Each deck of the headline occupies four lines of the grid and every headline has two lines of space underneath it. So again, no matter who's putting it together, every single part of the paper has the same amount of space underneath the headline, and it enables you to have a degree of consistency and coherence across an enormous product that's being produced by a lot of different people. The other thing about the redesign, the sort of fundamental element, was the typeface. And one of the things that the editor used to hate about the old design was this headline typography, which was um, Helvetica Black. And at this stage, it was in Helvetica Neue 95. And Alan used to say, the problem with this typeface is it can only shout. So that's fine on a day like this, when it's a massive news story, really dramatic and powerful. It's great if the headline shouts. But on a day like this, where basically there wasn't any news, and you have to fill the front page with a load of boring, sort of meaningless stories, it doesn't make sense to have a headline with that kind of power. So the first thing we needed to do was to create a new headline typeface which had some subtlety and range of expression. 
So we invented this typeface Guardian Egyptian. It was designed by two brilliant type designers, Paul Barnes in London and Christian Schwartz in New York, who have a type foundry called Commercial Type. And they were a brilliant combination because Paul has an incredible sense of typographic history, particularly British typographic history. Christian has worked in different environments, incredibly fast and imaginative, and between them, they came up with this typeface, which was neither a traditional serif, you know, it's very low contrast, uh, i.e. the thick strokes are not too far in weight from the thin strokes, so it's more like what you expect a sans serif typeface to be, but it's got the serifs, and it really seemed to bridge that gap between traditional classical typefaces and modern contemporary typefaces. We created quite a wide range of weights because we decided, well I decided out of perversity really, that I wanted the whole newspaper to be in one typeface. I didn't want any other typefaces in there. Although in the end we ended up designing um, a sans serif version, an agate version for use at very small sizes on things like stock prices and sports results. Uh, there were a whole range of things. We ended up with 200 fonts in the end. And then the last sort of fundamental building block was the title piece. Now if you work with newspapers, you find that people have an incredibly sentimental attachment to their logo or their title piece at the top of the paper. They always think that it's something that the readers are in love with, that you should never change. And people used to say about this, oh, the whole identity of the Guardian is expressed in this amazing piece of design. Now, in some cases it's true. I, I wouldn't change the title piece of the New York Times. I wouldn't change the title piece of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung because they're things that have been around for hundreds of years. But the Guardian typeface was actually, this, this title piece was designed in 1988. And actually, if you look at it, it is a really 1980s piece of design. You know, it just takes us back to the era of Reagan and Maradona. And the more I looked at it, the more dated it started to look. And Paul Barnes, the type designer, told me that this is just pure 1980s, get rid of it. So in the end, we changed the title piece too to something that we felt grew out of the typeface, so it was more something that was ours, and also something that was just more in line with all the digital developments we saw happening around us. So that was the paper that we ended up with, and we tried to make something that felt modern and contemporary, but still had a sense of tradition. It's got six stories on the front page, text on the front page. It feels like a serious newspaper. But it's not just about creating a product, a system, you know, a grid, a set of typefaces. It's also about creating a design language that you can use to communicate. And there was, it had to be a newspaper that could cover a wide range of material. So we wanted to be able to do pages which were frankly boring, because that was the problem with the old design. We couldn't do boring pages. And on a day when not very much is happening, it should look boring. But we also wanted to be able to respond to real events. And this was uh, uh, a shocking day in 2005, 2006, when there were terrorist bombings on buses and tubes all over London. So we were able to do a story like that, using photography in the way that a magazine would use it, and infographics. And we really created a whole visual language around photography, infographics, combining photography and graphics to tell stories in a much more magazine-like way than the newspaper had ever really tried to do before. And there, there was a, a physical aspect to this as well, that before this redesign, the infographics department was on a different floor from the editors, and the picture department was on a different floor from the editors. So one of the things that we did when we introduced the design was we rearranged the office so that the art director and the picture editor sat next to the duty editor of the day so that they could have the kind of conversations every day that magazine editors have with art directors. Uh, and one of the, the boldest things that we did was to devote the center spread of the newspaper every day to one single amazing news image. And this was really in response to the fact that it was becoming clear that readers had less and less time to spend with newspapers. They had to be able to engage with newspapers visually as well as reading stories because they wanted to get through quickly. So by giving them a picture on this scale, it meant that they could spend 30 seconds or a minute looking at this picture and learn just as much as they would do if they'd read an 800 word news story about it. So this was a, a school that was in Palestine that was bombed 
by Israel. This was uh, when we had a photographer embedded with the American forces in Iraq, came back with this image that just has a weird, kind of mythical, biblical sort of quality to it. But it wasn't all war. This is the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland. And using pictures of this scale really gave you a chance to sort of look at the details and understand the details. And we also did infographics, sometimes in the center spread, or combinations of photography and infographics. This was an amazing photo of the sun that had the, the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle tracking across the sun. So we, should, we ran the photograph also with a bit of infographic information about the space station and so on. And really, by the combination of photography, working with editing and infographics, scale, being able to use pictures in a dramatic way, we were able to take the visual language of the newspaper pretty much to the level of a magazine. And this sort of coincided with the time when actually the, the serious British magazines that used to do a lot of photojournalism were all moving towards celebrities and fashion. So the Guardian, in a sense, kind of took over that role that something like the Sunday Times magazine would have been doing in the 1960s. But it wasn't just the news section. There were four sections every day on a weekday. And probably the other really important section was this section, the G2, which was half the Berliner, which was effectively a daily magazine uh, produced in a space of about six or seven hours. They would decide the stories 10 o'clock in the morning. It would have to be sent off to the printer about six o'clock in the evening. And in that time, they would have to produce a 24-page magazine, which is astounding that they did it. And the quality of what they did was amazing, which was largely due to that uh, incredible art director, Richard Turley, who worked on The Guardian for a while before he went to New York. Amazing magazine quality layouts. Obviously, parts of it were formatted and uh, regular layouts, but still a lot of it had to be created every day, including the covers. Every single day, you would have to create a magazine cover out of a story that you only found out about at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they would have time to commission a photographer or an illustrator or a typographer. Other times they would just have to make do with library images, whatever came to hand. But incredibly inventive treatments of covers in really, really difficult and demanding conditions. And then at the weekend, there were nine sections. And the weekend reading experience is very different. People are not on their way to and from work. They're relaxing. They're at the cafe. So we tried to make the weekend paper more colorful. The typesetting was a little bit bigger. In general, it just became more magazine-like, more use of illustration and magazine-style photography. But of course, when the newspaper becomes more like a magazine, it's hard to know what the magazine can do. We also had a weekend magazine. So we just tried to make the magazine photography even more incredible. So the, the picture editors kind of upped their game on the magazine and just got some absolutely astounding images. So th this was just an amazing project to work on for me. And when you work on a project like this, you feel an incredible sense of responsibility um, to the audience, really. And it goes back to that stuff that Tibor was saying about putting the audience, uh, you know, at the, your first priority. And I felt it particularly strongly because my father had read The Guardian since I was a child. I grew up in a house surrounded by The Guardian. So I felt when I was doing this that I had to do something serious and good. But you have to really prioritize when you do a project like this and make sure that you get the right things right in the first place. And the first thing that we always think about is accessibility. So that's things like making it readable making sure people can find their way around. So, you know, the first thing that you have to get right is just choosing a typeface that people can read, making sure that it's a size that people can read, and not just a size that you can read if you're 20 and 30, but a size that your father can read if he's 70. The next thing is engagement. We have to create a product that people actually want to interact with. So it's not just about doing things that look beautiful. It's about creating designs and using images in a way that makes people want to learn and want to know what's going on in the world. Once you've got those right, you have the time to try and give it a personality and create something that says something about the voice of the paper or the magazine. And The Guardian had a very strong editorial attitude, a very clear idea about what its role was and what its responsibilities were. 
So we tried to create a newspaper that reflected that. And then the very last thing we think about is the aesthetics. Um, it's not that I don't want things to look beautiful or stylish or cool. I love it when we design things that are those things, but it has to be the last thing that you do. You have to get everything else right first and then make it stylish and beautiful. So this, this was a, an amazing project to work on. It won all sorts of a, a fantastic awards, including the legendary Black Pencil at the DNAD Awards, which was a wonderful surprise. It was a project that was imitated all over the world, <laughs> in Israel, in Romania. And these things keep, I still have my collection of little imitations of The Guardian, which is a very nice little library to have. And most importantly, the readers loved it. We got comments like this, no compromise, perfect intellectual and aesthetic symmetry. I've fallen in love. And um, I've redesigned a lot of products that people interact with on a daily basis, newspapers, magazines, websites. And it's almost unheard of to have totally positive reactions. And I'm, I'm cool with that because it's a shock to people when you change things that they use every day. And people have emotional relationships with newspapers and magazines. And we sometimes say it's a bit like going into somebody's house in the middle of the night and rearranging all the furniture. So when they come down in the morning, they think, what the hell is going on here? And often they react in a very hostile way. Uh, but you have to be able to take that. And then usually you find that a week later or two weeks later, they've forgotten what it used to look like and they like what you've done. But often on the first day, they hate it. But actually with this project, everybody loved it on the first day. And probably the most remarkable thing is that it still looks almost exactly the same today. This is a front page from this week. And it's maybe not that surprising to you because actually we're in a country where the newspapers don't change very much. I think La Vanguardia still looks pretty much like it looked 15 years ago. But in Britain, all the other newspapers have been redesigned three or four times, but The Guardian still has that same design. So that may mean that it was a wonderful piece of design or it may mean that nobody cares about print anymore and all the energy is going into digital, so why bother changing the paper? I don't know. But it's nice to see that it's still there. So this was a, a kind of historic project, really, because we had the right client. Alan, our editor, was a, a wonderful editor. We had the right budget. They actually spent quite a lot of money developing that typeface, millions building the printing factory that would print the color pages. And we had the right schedule, because it was, took nearly two years to print build that printing factory. And it's really incredibly rare to get all those three things together. Now, I don't want to depress you too much by saying it never happens. It does happen occasionally. And the good news is that actually you can do a pretty good job if you have two of these. And sometimes you can do a pretty nice job with one of them, especially the client. That's the most important. But you almost never get all three at once. So if you do get all three at once, make the most of it. So. I've been spending about uh, you know, 15, 17 years as a print designer, and something was just about to hit me, and it was this thing called the web. So we put incredible energy into redesigning the newspaper, but we had a website that was based on a completely different design that looked like it had absolutely no connection to the paper at all. So just coming straight off uh, two years of newspaper redesign, I had to start on the website redesign which we called R2, Redesign and Rebuild. And the, the biggest shock for me was how different it was from doing a print project. It wasn't a design project, it was a software development project. And because of that, we had about 50 tech people working on it and about six people in editorial and design. And it was a completely different world from what I was used to. So this was my design team for most of that project, Ben and Andy, two people, and then we had one more, Akemi came in during the process. And this was the tech team having one of their stand-up meetings every day. So when you start to engage with digital media, you're in a whole different world. And you have to learn and to think and behave very, very differently. Um, and we use this process called agile development, which is a very structured process that comes from the software industry. You know, if I wanted to design a magazine tomorrow, if somebody came to me and said, let's, let's make a magazine, we could probably have it out by Saturday because we know very easily how to create these things. But when you're creating digital products, there's an enormous amount of engineering and stuff involved. So you have to have a structured process. So every time, every element on this website 
started with a card like this. Somebody had to create the task, say what they wanted, write down a specification for it. The next stage is to wireframe it. You just make a very simple diagram of what the elements are going to be in the piece of work. That gets handed off to the developers and the design department. And then we would start designing, usually in InDesign, and actually we still use InDesign a lot, even for our digital design, because it's really good at handling text. And because most of the work that we do is editorial, we have to be able to work with text a lot. So we tend to use InDesign for the kind of visual prototyping. Once you get to a certain stage, you start working out the details and handing them off to the developers. Then you get to completely specifying every single part of it in terms of pixels and typefaces and so on. Then it has to go into what's called QA, quality analysis. It has to be tested to make sure that the element that they've built works with the rest of the website, isn't going to make the whole thing collapse. And in the end, you end up with a web page. So it's a very complex and slow process of development, very, very structured. And design has to kind of fit in there somewhere and work with technology. You can't just kind of go into a room and design a big news website like this. But in the end, we made a website that um, looked like it belonged to The Guardian. You can still see some elements of my kind of print background in here. 12 column grid, anyone who's ever designed a magazine knows that the 12 column grid is the ultimate magazine grid because you can make three columns, four columns or six columns. So there's still some really kind of old school editorial design thinking in here. And it was something that also got imitated in other parts of the world. This is a website from China and actually it's much easier to imitate a website because if they're smart enough they can just steal your code. They don't even have to rebuild it themselves. So um, this was my kind of baptism of fire with the digital well and it was a real culture shock, big change for me and I went through this sort of process which we've made a little graphic of, of starting off incredibly excited because I thought here is a new field to get into, it's going to be really great. My morale was very, very high and I knew absolutely nothing. And then the next stage was the kind of reality check where I started to understand what was going on. I learned a little bit and I started to think, oh no, it's not going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. The next stage was when I really started to understand a bit about digital media and I thought, right, this is it, I'm finished. Everything I know is irrelevant. I'm never going to be able to design in this environment. But slowly, as I learned a little bit more, I started to think, okay, I understand what's going on here. It's a whole different world. It's still design. It's a different kind of design. You know, it's sort of product design and architecture. But I can still do this. And at the end, your kind of knowledge and your morale sort of come together. And I was able to feel, okay, I, it's just another kind of field that I can work in. It's different from print, but it's not, you know, going to kill print. Uh, I can be a designer in the digital world too. So um, we've made a newspaper and a website that looked like they kind of belong together and pretty soon we followed that with a mobile site and uh, an iPhone app. And one of the most exciting things about this project was that almost by accident I found that I'd set out to design a newspaper and what I'd actually done was created a visual language that could be rolled out across a whole range of products and actually went beyond the products into advertising and marketing. And when The Guardian moved into their new building, it went into environmental design as well. And almost by accident, I'd become an identity designer. And I used to think that identities were something that like Wolf Owens did or Mucho did, but that I, was, I was a magazine designer or a newspaper designer. But by doing the Guardian project, I understood that actually every editorial project is also an identity project. Because you're not just designing a magazine or a newspaper, you're designing a visual voice for people that ought to be able to be applied in a wide range of contexts. And as you'll see, this is something that really influences the work that we do now. I think I might have to speed up a bit because I've got a whole load of other stuff to talk to you about. So April 2010 was an important moment. Uh, Steve Jobs announced the iPad 
and I decided I was going to leave The Guardian because I'd had a wonderful time there, but I'd been there for 15 years. I'd redesigned the weekend magazine six times, and it was time to go and do something different. But strangely, these two events were actually connected because the first project that my studio did after I left The Guardian was an iPad app for The Guardian. And um, it was an interesting product because The Guardian already had a whole range of products which were live based on the RSS feeds from the website, so constantly updated. So if you wanted to get up-to-date digital news, there were a lot of places you could go. So we made the decision that the iPad app shouldn't be based on these feeds and be constantly updated. And Alan Rusbridge has said what he wanted was a print-oriented product for the digital age. And that ended up taking the form of a daily edition that was only published once a day and only had the content from the newspaper in it. And it was an interesting strategy because one of the, the things we found, particularly with older readers, was that they found the digital products intimidating because they're endless. You know, there's so much content in there, there's constantly new content arriving, and any link can take you out into the kind of ocean of the internet. And they miss the feeling that you get from a physical newspaper or a magazine that there's an end to it. So we tried to create something that had those characteristics of print. But we had to ask, what is the essence of the print reading experience? And to me, it came down to two things. One is hierarchy. So when we look at a spread like that, it's obvious to us which is the main story, which is the second story, which is the third story, and which is the fourth story. It's very clear what decisions the editors made in terms of importance. And nobody has to tell us that. It's just something we know from our hundreds of years of dealing with print. But a lot of digital products don't have that because you tend to navigate digital products by means of lists and menus that have no hierarchy. Everything's on the same level. So that was something we wanted to get in here. The other thing that you get from a newspaper or magazine is the opportunity to have an overview by just turning pages. You know, very few people start at the beginning of a newspaper and read it all the way through. They'll flick through, looking at different pages, and then go back and decide what they're going to read. So we wanted to bring that to the iPad app as well. So we prototyped a few things. Um, we did stuff like this, which we ended up rejecting because we felt it was too much like a newspaper. But we also did things like this, which had sort of layers and bits that slid around and so on, which was lovely interaction on the iPad. But in the end, we decided that we'd created a kind of application interface. And editorial products are not applications like you know, Twitter or email services. People want to read them in a particular way. So we dismissed both those routes, and in the end, it was the good old grid that gave us the, the route we were going to go on. This was my sketch, as you can see. It's the boxes again, my obsession with boxes. Out of that, we created a grid which worked on the iPad, and we ended up with this system, which was a series of pages which were never more than two screens long, so you didn't end up scrolling endlessly. And the whole content of the newspaper would be arranged across a limited range of screens so that you could flick through them like you can with a newspaper and get a sense of all the content without actually reading any of it. Of course, there was a lot of development between having the idea and making it happen. Lots of very detailed typographic work is involved in putting something like this together, checking different weights of typefaces, color systems, different background colors, and so on. But we ended up with this as I say, is a series of pages based on that modular grid. Important stories get a lot of space. Less important stories get a smaller space. It's back to that kind of print mindset about how you apply a hierarchy to a product. And uh, we thought that we'd managed to create something which had the elements that people loved about print, but also felt like it really belonged on the iPad. There were a series of article templates, too, so that the articles didn't become too monotonous. And one of the things I really enjoyed about this was the iPad was very new in those days, and there weren't many tools for prototyping interactions. If you wanted to see what an interaction felt like, you basically had to code it. You had to do the programming, and we didn't have the resources to do that. So what we did was a series of incredibly low-tech animatics, <laughs> cutting out pieces of paper and making little movies. And of course, you don't need to do this now because there are wonderful prototyping tools for iOS. But in those days, they didn't exist. And I love the fact that we were doing something which, at that time, was on the very cutting edge of technology. 
in this incredibly low-tech manner. There's a whole other story that I just don't have time to go into now about how we translated the newspaper pages into the, uh, the iPad pages. Uh, it involved this idea which the, the developers call the algorithmic art director, which analyzed the designs of the newspaper and tried to take out a series of values about how much space stories were getting and so on. And this algorithmic art director eventually ended up being called Robot Mark Porter. <laughs> um, but the good news is that actually robots don't make very good designers. So the algorithm would make some pages and then some humans would have to come in and tidy them up and change the robot's decisions. But in the end, we made a great product, I think. Some obliging bloggers said some very nice things about it, like the Guardian app doesn't look like print, it looks like the future. Uh, I think this is just about to be replaced or has been replaced by a new iPad app which is based on the RSS feed. So again, it just goes to show that nothing good lasts forever. So, um, having just spoken about a digital project, I'm just going to kind of digress a little bit and talk a little bit about the sort of philosophy of print and digital because I spent the first part of my career totally in print and I thought I was going to be a print designer all my life. The world changed and I had to respond to that. But printing is a really archaic sort of Victorian technology. And anyone who's been to a printing factory knows that it's a really messy business. You know, you go to a printing factory and there are enormous hot machines and real world materials like paper and ink and it's noisy and, you know, it's, it's a really physical environment. And when the paper goes through the printing press, something amazing happens because the form that we as designers have chosen to impose on the content are fused together and they can never be separated. You know, once a magazine or a book is printed, the form is the content. You can never tear them apart. And that gives print some really amazing qualities. One of them is permanence. If you come to my studio in London, you'll see piles of magazines from the 1960s because that's where I steal all my ideas from. And some of these magazines are 50 years old and they're still amazing but I can guarantee that the digital products we're working on now will not be around in 50 years' time. Scale is another thing that you get from print that you don't get from digital. When I was doing that Guardian Weekend magazine, it was a big tabloid newsprint magazine, and I was able to do things like use Nelson Mandela's face twice as big as life-size. So it lets you play games with scale, and drama comes out of that. But in digital, we have no idea what size people are going to see things, so we just don't get the chance to do this kind of thing. Precision is another thing. This is a wonderful layout from the Sunday Times magazine in the 1970s when Elvis died. And uh, it's one of my favorite magazine spreads of all time. And the reason it's great is that everything is the perfect size and it's in the perfect position. You know, if this picture was a bit bigger and this picture was a bit smaller, or this headline was in a different place, it simply wouldn't work as a piece of design. But in print, we can put things in one place at one size and they stay there. It never changes. And then finally, of course, there's physical interaction. You know, printed magazines and newspapers have a weight and a smell. You pick them up, you turn the pages. And um, my children, every Friday, say, can I have a magazine? I've got children who are 8 and 11. They still want to buy magazines. You know, they're on their iPads all the time. But the reason they love magazines is they can interact with them physically. And the editor of this magazine, a very successful magazine in the UK for children, says, you might be able to look at a digital game or magazine, but you can't cut things out, colour in, take pen to paper, or stick it on your wall. So that kind of physicality of print is still something that appeals to young children, no matter how at home they are with digital media. Digital is a completely different thing. You know, we call these things web pages, but they're not pages. What they actually are is computer programs. This is what a web page looks like. And you know, the content that we choose as designers to impose on this computer program is in a very fragile state. You know, we can try and condition how it looks, but we can never finalize how it looks. And in some cases, that's to our advantage because it means we can make the content behave differently on a range of different devices. So this is, you know, responsive web design is absolutely standard now. A few years ago, nobody had ever heard of it, but it's the way we always work now. And we can make that content do different things, which is great. But the downside of it is if somebody wants to look at this content 
and they haven't updated their browser for two years, then it's not going to look the same. Uh, and if they're working, looking on out-of-date equipment or on a kind of phone that we haven't designed for, all the design disappears. Another thing that's really hard to get used to is the clients that we work with, a lot of their publishing activity is outside their kind of world and we can't design it. Uh, a newspaper like the New York Times is a lot of their activity is happening on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube and beyond giving them an avatar, we can't design that environment. That environment belongs to Facebook or Twitter and we just have to accept that. And then the other really shocking thing when you come from the print world is the reliance in digital on metrics. I don't know how many of you have a lot of experience with working on websites, but all the clients that I work with on the web now have software like this called Chartbeat, which gives them constantly updated real-time information about what's happening on the site. So they know exactly how many users they've got, they know exactly where their traffic is coming from, whether it's coming from Yahoo or Google, whether it's coming from Facebook or Twitter or from email. They know exactly who's reading which story, which story is most popular. And this kind of information can be really addictive. I mean, I've heard it described as digital heroin. And people become obsessed with these metrics. And you know, they put up a story and if it doesn't get a certain amount of views in a certain amount of time, they'll chuck that story out and put another story out. And working in this kind of environment as a designer is extremely challenging because your work can be quantified by numbers. You know, we're used to a world in which design is an aesthetic and personal judgment. Some people like it, some people don't like it. You might be able to analyze how well a product works, but here it's all about the numbers. And if you do a design that makes the numbers go down, then you failed. So that's a really shocking thing to get used to. But leaving that aside, because it's super scary, um, we still have to design these things. And you know, we do a lot of digital design now in my studio. And in the world that we live in now, we generally have to design everything at least three different ways for different devices, often much more than that, because now there's a whole proliferation of different devices that kind of sit between the big tablets and the small smartphones. So, you know, it's not like the world of print where everything is one size and behaves in one way. We have to design things that bend and stretch and mutate, behave differently on different devices. And it's getting worse, you know. It's not just about three different things, it's about hundreds of different things. It's about televisions, you know. I've got an internet TV at home, probably most of you do as well. It's about cars. Cars now have the internet. And it's soon going to be about this. The Apple Watch is probably the most reduced environment that exists for publishing. But news publishers are going to be on this device. But here, design has no role to play. You know, all you can do is put your avatar in the corner and put up one sentence of type in the typeface which Johnny Ive has already designed for the iWatch. So the, the design, the editorial design in this is, is negligible, really. So that, that could be kind of depressing. So I think it's a kind of reaction to that and the rise of mobile and everything else that a lot of people have started trying to create these sort of widescreen, seductive experiences for the web. It all started with this thing that the New York Times did called Snowfall. I don't know if you've seen this a few years ago, very kind of long form writing with embedded video and infographics and full screen pictures and really immersive kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I like it in one sense because I'm a magazine designer and it's kind of like a magazine. And some people have taken that approach and taken it to incredible levels. And the music website Pitchfork has done some just astounding things with um, parallax scrolling and so on. And, you know, as a magazine designer, this stuff appeals to me because it's, you know, it, it's pretty exciting stuff, really. But as a reaction to what's really happening in the digital world, it's not a solution because... You know, the problem with these things is you need to have a big browser and a fast connection and that's increasingly not how people use the internet. You know, nowadays, most people are getting the internet on their phones and these amazing things just don't work on phones. You know, this incredible experience is reduced to a headline and a picture that you scroll up like you do every single other phone website. And most of my clients in the last maybe three years have seen their mobile audience grow from nothing 
to 60, 70, 80 percent of their audience. So a lot of the time when we're designing digital products for publishers now, it's about the mobile. And it, it is kind of depressing if you're coming from a world where you were an art director. I mean, if you compare a magazine with a mobile design, on a magazine I would say about 10 percent of it is what we call UI, user interface. So that would be things like page labeling, folios, helping people find their way around. But 90% of it is responding to the content and finding a visual form for the content. But in the mobile environment, those figures are almost completely reversed. You know, at least 90% of it is about user interface. It's about how people interact with the content, how they navigate, architecture, and only about 10% of it, or less actually, sometimes zero, is about a visual response to the content. So, if all I had to do was design mobile experiences for publishers, I would be very, very sad. These are two projects that we've done in the last couple of years for very, very different clients, but they're both in the news business. And when you get down to it, they both want to have, you know, between three and five headlines visible on the screen of the phone. They both want to use a picture. And all the work that we've done about visual language and type and color and space is lost in this environment. So, you know, the, the whole design process gets limited to a very, very fine point. But luckily that's not all we have to do, otherwise I think I'd be leaving the design business round about now. So, oh no, I'm, I'm okay, I'm still going. Um, about five years ago I started my studio, Mark Porter Associates, after I left The Guardian. Uh, we're a very small studio, the, there's sort of two or three of us full time, including at the moment I have an intern who was educated at Eli Sava, who's doing a great job, so I'm very happy about that. So I'm just going to show you a few things that we've worked on in the last five years since I left The Guardian. One of the first things we did was a magazine called Courrier International in Paris, which is uh, one of weird, kind of eccentric French magazine, very kind of left-wing view of the world. It's not quite Charlie Hebdo, but one of those kind of iconoclastic, very dynamic French magazines. And one of the things that was fun about this project was we tried to do something that looked French. And you know, most of my work is international, I do very little work in the UK now. And it's an interesting question about how much I should adapt what I do to different environments. And I studied languages at university, I like to try and understand cultures and design cultures and adapt what I do, but I need to be very careful that I don't end up just as if I'm talking in a bad French accent sort of pastiching French design. And you know, if you know anything about French graphic design, it's kind of crazy and completely unlike anything from any other country. And we tried not to sort of do an imitation of French design, but at least allow French design sensibility to influence what we did. And I, I love this project, I'm still really proud of it. But just after we did it, the editor got sacked and somebody else came in and redesigned it. But a lot of the work that I do now is more like this. This is um, some work that I did with a newspaper in Stockholm in Sweden called Svenska Dagbladet. And I had a great relationship with them and with their art director, Anna Turfjell. And um, interestingly, France, which is very close to England, seemed very alien to me. But in Scandinavia, I feel much more at home. I think Scandinavian design and British design are much closer. Uh, and I worked with them for several years on lots of different projects. I started off doing their website, svd.se, and then I did some branding work with them. I consulted a bit for Anna when she redesigned the newspaper. I did a magazine, a sort of style interiors magazine with Anna for them. And the studio did a culture magazine last year. And this is much more the kind of project that I do now, where I work with clients doing a range of different things, uh, some of it digital, some of it print, all about creating those identities that work across platforms. The Culture Magazine in particular was a wonderful thing to do. Svensson Dagblad had this lovely typeface which was designed for them in the 1960s by a, Sw a Swedish type designer called, I think, Carl Erik Forsberg. And it's really distinctive and beautiful. So this magazine, which was the sort of culture literature magazine, became very much a celebration of words and a celebration of the, the qualities of this Forsberg typeface. It's an absolutely lovely thing to work on, very much about good writing, good photography, and so on. Uh, beautiful. 
But you know, I'm talking a lot about the project that I've done that I'm really proud of, that I think was successful. But I wouldn't like to give you the impression that it always goes well. So I thought it'd be fun to show you two jobs that went horribly wrong. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen occasionally. One of them was when we were invited to do a redesign of this newspaper from Paris, the Journal du Dimanche, which is the only national Sunday newspaper in France. And my friends in Paris told me that uh, Journal du Dimanche, which is usually reduced to GVD, it, it's a kind of part of the weekend life in Paris. You go out on Sunday morning down to the boulangerie on the corner, you buy your croissant, you get your GVD, and you come home and drink your coffee and read the paper. And it's one of the lovely things about working with newspapers is that they're often really integrated in the culture of a country. And you get to sort of work with products which people use every day and love. So we were really excited to be doing this. And we did our, um, our design proposals. We thought they should just change the name to GDD because that's what everybody called it. And we thought we'd done a pretty nice job. The editors seemed very happy with it. It got all the way through till about a week before publication and never any sense that they didn't like it. And then the editor called me and said, actually, we don't really think we want to do a redesign after all. And in the end, they took about half of what we'd done, half of what they had before, just kind of mashed it all up and published it. So sadly, our, our jeu de day never saw the light of day. The other kind of biggest disaster I've had in the studio was this magazine, Panorama which was Italy's biggest selling news magazine published in Milan and owned by Mondadori, which is the, the big publishing house, which is ultimately owned by Silvio Berlusconi. And this magazine had become a pretty low quality editorial product. It was very much used by Berlusconi as a sort of political tool. But it had an amazing history. It had been started as a joint venture with Time magazine in the 1960s, used to have brilliant photojournalism, so I was brought in and the brief was that we're going to go back to the history of Panorama. We're going to reinvent it as a wonderful, serious news magazine with brilliant photojournalism. And we did this design for them, which I was very proud of. Uh, again, we tried to do something Italian. Italian magazines are really dynamic and active. So we couldn't have done something like we did in Sweden. There had to be a lot happening on every page. But we did it in a way that we felt was right for them, that had the right kind of sensibility. It felt Italian, but it also felt serious. And again, um, except this time they didn't even tell me before they published it. They just took it away with their art director and sort of hacked it up in a room. And what came out was sort of a bit like what we'd done and a bit like something else. So it was very sad. But, you know, sometimes these things happen. I'm never quite sure why they happen. I think it's probably about communication. Maybe they never told us what they really wanted or we never understood what they really wanted or you know, it's sad when things go wrong. But I don't think it's about working with clients in different cultures because we did this in Italy, which was a failure. But we also have a wonderful client in Italy called Internazionale, who we've been working with for years and we still work with. It's a, a great news magazine that has a really passionate young readership, very, very committed to the magazine. We redesigned the printed magazine six or seven years ago. And actually, in this case, we tried to do something that was very un-Italian. We did something very, very structured, very kind of sober and organized typography, very much in the mode of The Economist or The New Yorker or something, very different from the Italian news magazines. And then they came back to us a couple of years ago with a plan to launch a new digital product, which wasn't just going to be the online magazine, but was going to be a, a new news source, a kind of serious new daily web newspaper for Italy. So we tried to take the typographic elements that we'd made for the magazine and reimagine them for digital. And it's only been possible to do this for about maybe three, four years with developments in web fonts and new versions of the CSS styling uh, markup that you use on top of the HTML. But it, it finally became possible to do things on the web, like old style figures and small caps, and just trying to get that kind of typographic richness that we were used to from print into the website. So it, it's basically very typographic, but they love photography too. So we had to create some spaces for them where the photographs could really sing. They started to do a lot of web video as well. So we created big uh, spaces for them to do their web stuff. 
And they also love comics and cartoons, so they had a place there too. And this kind of grew into another of those projects where you design a magazine, you design a website, and before you know it, you're designing an identity because they also do a lot of events. They have a, a conference every year which enormous amounts of readers turn up to. They started doing a lot of web video, so we ended up giving them some motion graphics too. So it's very rarely now a question of just designing a magazine or a, a website. It's more often about designing everything for a publisher and also giving them other assets like motion graphics and so on that they can use. I'm nearly done, two more projects and then you can go home. Um, this is a digital magazine which we produce for a charity in the UK called Nesta, which is about innovation. And this is the current issue actually, which is out at the moment on the theme of stagnation. And this has just been interesting because we've been working with some people in London who are starting to create magazine publishing tools that generate HTML, responsive HTML. So there's no printed version of this magazine. It only exists on the web and on devices. And the software that we're using, it's still, you know, not quite perfect, but it has the kind of interface that we're used to from InDesign or Illustrator or something. But at the end of the process, it makes HTML pages. And we're pushing it a bit. We're trying to get it to do things that it still can't really do because it can't do this kind of detailed typography. So we're still doing some of the headlines as images and so on. But we're really trying to push digital magazine making to a position where it's as good as doing a printed magazine. And then the most recent and most exciting thing we've done has been a rebrand of this TV news channel in the Netherlands. And TV is a whole new area for me. I'd never done any television work before. Um, they came to us originally asking if we would work on a website redesign. And we said, yes, of course, but we know you're working on a channel rebrand. We'd like to pitch for that too. So I got together with a brilliant creative director in Amsterdam called Dylan Griffith, who had worked at MTV and really understood the television business. And we did it as a collaboration with me as the sort of content and news guy and him as the TV guy. Now, this is what it used to look like. And we found when we started looking at television, that when you look at the design of TV news, it starts to become very repetitive and familiar. And almost every TV news network in the whole world has a 3D shiny graphic of a pulsating world glow. And um, that's boring because everybody does the same thing. But it's not just boring. I think it's a completely misguided idea about what news is these days. Because this sort of graphic language and iconography goes back to the 1950s, before the internet, before sort of easily available color printing, when the only way you could find out what was going on in the world was by, from the radio or the television. Only the broadcasters had access to that information. But nowadays, if we want to know what's going on in Syria, we go to Twitter or YouTube. We don't have to go to the broadcasters. So this kind of visual language is completely outdated, and yet everybody in TV news is still using it. So we said, we're going to do an identity that has no globes. The other interesting thing is that everything is kind of three-dimensional and shiny. And this is a visual language that actually came in in the 1980s with the Quantel paint box, which was the first sort of desktop 3D animation and modeling system when it became possible to do these sort of shiny metallic 3D objects. And it seems like the news business fell in love with this stuff in 1984 and is still using it 30 years later. So we decided we were going to try and do something that got away from all the cliches of TV news design uh, and did something fresh and contemporary. And I'm going to show you a little video about it now. RTL News is the Netherlands' leading commercial TV news service with an audience of up to 2 million viewers. To coincide with the move to full HD broadcasting, they needed a vibrant new visual identity. Mark Porter Associates teamed up with Smorgasbord Studio and rose to the challenge. Mark Porter's experience with some of Europe's biggest news brands and Smorgasbord's track record in broadcast identity made for a perfect partnership. While most TV news design has remained stuck in an iconography of pulsating globes and glossy 3D objects, 
the world has been changing. Viewers now get their news from smartphones as well as TV screens. We wanted to reflect this reality. Over 18 months, we reimagined every aspect of RTL News' output. From logos and title sequences, through on-screen graphics for news, weather and business, to the studio set, music and digital platforms. But we never forgot that content is king. Whether our news comes from TV, the web or mobile apps, we view the world through a rectangular frame. RTL News takes a torrent of raw information and frames the essentials, adding context and meaning. So the frame became our metaphor, influencing the visual expression of the brand at every level, from the new logo to the set design. The design is bold and uncluttered, a graphic toolkit where typography, colour and image all play a role in the storytelling process. We've created an environment where editors and presenters can communicate clearly and directly with their audience. For the title sequences, stings and bumpers, we worked with digital artists, Universal Everything. The new titles reflect RTL's broad focus, zooming in from the global perspective to the individual. They also evoke the digital conversations that are now part of our everyday lives. The mood changes as the day progresses, from a warm sunrise for the breakfast bulletin to a sparkling night scene for late news. Color-coded containers support the on-screen information, with sizes and colors determined by the editorial hierarchy. The house font is graphic. It's clean, readable and timeless, and our friends at Commercial Type in New York have created a bespoke version for RTL News. We've responded to the growing importance of data journalism with a range of map, chart and diagram styles which prioritize simplicity and clarity. And we've brought a contemporary approach to the weather, introducing a new icon set, revised maps and an intuitive color system for temperature data. And it's not business as usual on RTLZ, the home of RTL's economics and finance coverage. The business channel also benefits from the new approach, with stunning new titles and sharper infographics helping the journalists to reveal the facts behind the figures. Modern news organisations engage with their audience through multiple channels, so we also redesigned RTL's website and mobile apps, reinforcing the new identity with enhanced functionality. The studio has been pared back to the minimum, a desk and four massive screens forming a dramatic canvas for our bold and dynamic graphics. And we work with composer Martin Schimmer to create a contemporary digital soundtrack that complements our visual language. Good news design helps to break down the barriers between broadcaster and audience. Mark Porter Associates and Smorgasbord have created a bold, contemporary identity that gives RTL News a clear and distinctive voice in the connected media world. So, that was a fantastic project and as you can see, a lot of people are involved in a project like that, from the set designers, the music composers, the animators and so on. So we're now in a world where we do print, web, broadcast, identities. We're doing a really rich and wide range of different kinds of design. And it's very hard to do this kind of thing from a, you know, as a small studio or as an individual. My phone is ringing, I won't take it. Um, you have to be able to collaborate with people. So um, we have a kind of network with ourselves in the middle and there's certain things that we can do without getting any help from outside. Print design, identity design, digital design are kind of at the heart of what we do. But we also have a range of collaborators who are very close to us with whom we work on things like typeface design, motion design, infographics. And then if we need them, we can also call on all sorts of specialists like information architects, user experience people, developers, filmmakers and animators. So it's a way to keep fairly small, to, to have a control over what we do. We don't want to be an enormous studio with 20 or 30 people working in it, but we can respond and do big jobs because we have a great network of collaborators and contributors that we work with. But the best thing about this really is that every time I work with one of these people, I learn something new. 
and it goes way back to you know what I was saying at the very beginning when I was at Oxford. Learning is the essence of it, really. I've been doing this for 25 years, but I still learn something new every day, and I think that's the best thing about a design career is that you never stop learning. Thank you. You've been amazingly patient. I didn't think anyone would sit still for an hour and a half while I said all that. So thank you. If anybody wants to ask anything. Alguien tiene alguna pregunta para Mark? Alguien le quiere hacer alguna pregunta a Mark? It's fine if you don't want to ask any questions. It's getting kind of hot in here. Maybe it's time to go and have a drink. Oh. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay. I actually have three questions uh, related with uh, typography, with type design. Uh, first is uh, how often do you commission uh, type, custom type design projects uh, to find out a little bit about the, the state of the, of the uh, you know, type design industry mm -hmm. in that sense? Second is if you can give me any uh, reasons uh, why do you commission type design projects? And I'm more interested in the technical reasons other yeah. than um, identity or economical reasons. And third is uh, what, how do you find out about new typefaces that you want to use for your projects? Okay, um, I've already forgotten what the first question was. Yeah. <laughs> why do we commission? Yeah. Oh, how often, how do, often do you commission? How often do you commission? Okay, um, we commission less than maybe we did five or ten years ago because it's quite an expensive business to get a custom typeface. Getting the work done is a cost and then getting the licenses so that your client can use it and nobody else can use it is very expensive because type design you know, works with licenses. They don't just do the work for you. Um, the Guardian was a very unusual example where we tried a lot of different typefaces. We felt that for kind of aesthetic reasons and identity reasons, we did need a custom typeface. It ended up just growing and growing, become much bigger than we expected. In most cases, there's something out there that works reasonably well. Often we get modifications done, so we'll get people to take an existing typeface and just do some different things to it for specific requirements. So it's more often a case of that, of working with people with existing typefaces. I mean, sometimes people say, why do you need a new typeface? Because there are, you know, a gazillion typefaces out there already. But, you know, there are a million novels out there, and people still write new novels. There are a million paintings out there, and people still do new paintings. So I love to see new type, and I think there's always a place for new type. And particularly as it becomes more about creating identities for people, and less about creating individual products, then I do think type design has a very important role to play in that. Uh, the second question was? Te the, uh, technical reason reasons for yeah. commissioning. Um, I don't know if there are technical reasons. I mean, occasionally there are technical reasons to do with language and so on, because we work with a lot of foreign clients, so sometimes they can't use existing typefaces because the accents aren't right, or they don't have the right characters or something. But realistically, when we do commission type, we mainly do it for reasons of aesthetics and identity, that we want people to have something that nobody else has got. You know, that's the main reason for doing it. And then, how do I keep up with developments in type? Um, I try to just follow blogs and follow type designers on Twitter and always see what new stuff is happening. But to be honest with you, I have a very close relationship with a few type designers, including commercial type. And I often end up using their products because I know them well. I know they will adapt things for me. I know that if I've got a client who doesn't have much money, they'll do the work for me for not much money in exchange for the next client who has lots of money. So you do have personal relationships with people. But you know sometimes they just don't have the right typeface. And we end up just using something of somebody else's. So you know I keep up with new type designs in the same way I keep up with developments in digital media and what's happening in the design world 
through Twitter and through following bloggers on the internet just like everybody else. But I do have personal relationships with some type designers, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alguna pregunta més? Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, you've told us about where you've come from and where sort of you're right now, but you haven't told us about where you're going. So where I'm going? Um, no, because the thing that I've learned in the last 10 years is that you never know what's going to happen next. You know, I never knew that the internet was going to come along. I just got used to the internet, and then I didn't know that mobile was going to come along. I just got used to mobile. Now there's watches. I have no idea what's going to happen next. So, you know, I just have to keep learning and growing and being ready to do the work that my clients need. And as my clients publish on more and more different platforms, I have to be there. I think, um, you know, we could maybe get a little bit bigger. I'm starting to feel that maybe two or three designers is not enough, despite our network of collaborators. I don't want to get too much bigger. We could get a little bit bigger. But I still like to keep working with other people. And if anything, I'd like to collaborate more because I'm really enjoying those relationships and learning from those relationships. But really, you know, in the media, you never know what's going to happen. So you just have to be ready to react rather than making a plan. Because if you make a plan, it will go wrong. All right, cheers. Algo más que vulgui preguntar? Okay, well, thank you for your patience. I can see you're getting hot, yes, so you. please. Thank you. It was brilliant. Brilliant lecture. Thank you very much. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. It wasn't too bad on the timing. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. <laughs>